So Karl Marx is almost certainly the most famous communist of all time. And if anyone talks to you about communism, most likely there'll be some connection between what they're talking about and Marx's ideas. But as Keelan just said, Marx wasn't born a communist. Um, and communism in general existed quite a long time before Marx was even born. So how is it that Marx became a communism, first of all, but perhaps more importantly, how did he change communism forever? Um, so I'm going to start with, by giving a little bit of a historical context into the, the world in, into which um, Marx was born. Marx was born in Trier in West Germany in, on the 5th of May, 1818. Now, Trier had experienced the storm and stress of the French Revolution, the Revolutionary Wars, and the Napoleonic Wars. It had been occupied by French forces, but then had actually fallen under the rule of the Kingdom of Prussia after the defeat of Napoleon and the re-establishment, the restoration of absolutist rule in Germany, of course, in Russia, under the Holy Alliance, and the restoration of the old Bourbon dynasty in France. Um, this meant that Marx was born into a period of political reaction, repression, censorship. At the same time, Germany didn't exa exist in a vacuum, and you had the rise of industrialization and liberalism in countries like England, France. The 1830 revolution was watched with sympathy by a number of German middle-class liberals, including Marx's own father, Heinrich. Um, father had, uh, his, uh, Marx's father had converted from Judaism to Protestantism in order to avoid repression under the Prussian absolutist state. And he actually held a private celebration for the July Revolution in 1830. Only a private one, though, because he didn't want to draw too much unwanted attention. So you had a period in which, under the surface of apparent stability, semi-feudal stability, you still had feudal property in much of Germany, you still had serfdom in parts of the country, and this gigantic absolutist bureaucracy um, ruled over by King Frederick William IV of Prussia. But under the surface, you actually start to have economic development and transformation just beginning to take place. Certain economic reforms, like the, the formation of an all-German customs union and tariff barriers to protect just the emerging nascent German industry, I started to create a, a bourgeoisie proper, although this was a small and scattered around the country. But this bourgeoisie was starting to look with sympathy to the more advanced countries, trying to basically appropriate their ideas. Um, but this was in conditions of, of relative to Europe at the time, to the more advanced capitalist countries, um, extreme backwardness. Mar Marx joked that Germany shared the restoration, that is the counter-revolution of the modern nations, without sharing its revolution. It hadn't achieved any of the tasks of the bourgeois democratic revolution. It was only on the threshold of capitalist development, and yet it had a restored absolutist monarchy and the repression that all other countries were going through. So this was a, a great contradiction, really, that Marx grew up with as a child. At the same time, the, the increasing power of the market was starting to intertwine with feudal property. The feudal lords were enclosing peasants' lands and then using the law to force peasants who were stealing from their lands, stealing from their land, to work on their lands like a new form of serfdom. Capitalism and feudalism were starting to intertwine. And Marx again witnessed this. Marx's own father actually represented, defended peasants who were being prosecuted under these laws. And it must have had an, a, an impact on the young Marx. So this was also the, the but at the same time, the, the, the German middle class was looking to places like France and England, looking to liberalism, but without the class basis to actually apply this in a political movement. There, were no, there wasn't even a bourgeois political party. Liberalism was only really just coming into being in Germany. And so Marx makes the point that actually all these ideas aren't in, digested as political ideas. They're not put into practical application. Instead, they're received in their kind of pure form, in the form of philosophy. And he actually said that Hegel's philosophy of right, of the state, was simply this. It was taking foreign liberalism and expressing it as this kind of pure, absolute moral idea. This is the intellectual environment into which Marx uh, emerged, really. He first started going to university in Bonn. It's where he also began his relationship with Jenny von Westphalen. But uh, he, was, he was obviously enjoying the student life a little bit too much and eventually was sent to university in Berlin. This is the University of Hegel and Hegelianism. Interesting fact is initially Marx didn't like Hegel. He resisted Hegel because he complained about the craggy melody of his writing. So it seems that Marx found Hegel as difficult to read as the rest of us did. <laughs> and he resisted it. And instead he, he, he took up other famous German philosophies, uh, philosophers like Kant. And there's a fascinating letter that he writes to his father at the age of 19 in November 1837 in which he says... 
He talks about there are moments in one's life which are like frontier posts marking the completion of a period, but at the same time clearly indicating a new direction. At such a moment of transition, we feel compelled to view the past and the present with the eagle eye of thought in order to become conscious of our real position. And I quoted that in full because this is something that Marx comes back to. This is a process that Marx goes through several times throughout his life. You, have, you, you see these important staging posts in his journey, if you like, towards revolutionary communism and Marxism, which I'll try to draw out in this introduction. But at this staging post, Marx talks about how he threw himself into his studies. And what he tried to do, he was studying law. He tried to compile a, a complete system of law. And what that meant in Germany in the early 19th century was a metaphysical system. First, he just used a number of logical categories that apply to all legal systems of all time, the essence of law, if you like. Um, he then researched thoroughly um, you know, cases, legal history, he tried to absorb the subject matter, which is again a constant throughout Marx's life. He dives into the subject matter. And he tries to make the facts that he's just learned fit to this system that he just developed in pure thought. And he writes to his father basically saying it was all rubbish. Everything I'd done was rubbish. You can see the despair in his writing. He'd spent a year, written 300 pages, and he said it was just complete nonsense. Uh, he, he's, and, but he discovers, already at this young age, he discovers the limitations of idealism. He says that, um, here above all, the same opposition between what is and what ought to be, which is characteristic of idealism, stood out as a serious defect. The mistake lay in my belief that matter and form can and must develop separately from each other. Every time he was trying to apply this metaphysical method that he himself said was inspired by Kant, he was getting nowhere. And so reluctantly, he had to turn to Hegel. And he says, in a, period, in, a, in a period of long illness, he read all of Hegel. That's when he d dived into Hegel. Maybe that's the best way to read Hegel. <laughs> And he was completely convinced. But what I find fascinating is, so Hegel was also an idealist, but Marx is approaching Hegel from the standpoint of rejecting idealism and metaphysics. What he took, what he was inspired by in Hegel was this idea of seeking the idea in reality itself. There's a famous expression from Hegel, the truth is concrete. So Marx, who was not yet an explicit materialist, was approaching Hegel to a certain extent in materialist fashion, wanting to actually dive into and understand reality. And again, this is an absolute constant um, throughout his life. While, uh, when he encounters Hegelianism, he also encounters what he refers to as a doctor's club, what we know as the young Hegelians or left Hegelians. These were some, some older than Marx, but these are, are, are students, people have already acquired their doctorate. Essentially, I mean, really liberal academics. What made them left Hegelians was not that they were socialists, or certainly not communists. It was that um, in contrast to the kind of official right Hegelians who were on, the, on behalf of the Prussian state trying to force Hegel, Hegel's philosophy to support the state church, the absolutist bureaucracy, saying that this is basically the end point of all historical development. The young Hegelians were saying, no, actually, in Hegel's philosophy, there is a, a, a constant change and a transformation. Politically, though, they weren't revolutionaries. They were in favor of a, constituent, um, a constitutional monarchy. And the way they wanted to carry this out was that they would get jobs in universities in the state bureaucracy, which was extremely large and fruitful area of employment at that time, and they would mold the nation. They would transform the nation through thought. And Marx himself, he writes to his father saying, that's the career I want to take. Unfortunately for him, but fortunately for us, the Prussian state did not agree with that career path. And the, the censor prevented all of the young Hegelians from getting prof uh, professor positions, which meant that the young, still, I would say, liberal Marx, decides to take up journalism. And he gets involved in the Rheinische Zeitung, that is the, the Rhineland Times, uh, which he eventually becomes the editor of. The, uh, this is at the age of about 23 in 1842. And at this time, he's, again, he's not a communist. You would describe him as a, a radical liberal or maybe a left liberal. He talks about free speech. He writes of free speech, the free press. It's the characterful, rational, moral essence of freedom. Not really the Marx that we know, still very Hegelian in its treatment. But you can still see his sympathy for the poor and his indignation at the, the grasping looting of the landowners and the rich. He writes an article about uh, the uh, debates in parliament about w uh, laws over the, the, st the picking up of wood that's fallen from the landowners' forests. And at that time, it's clear that he has encountered some socialist ideas, and he's probably read Proudhon's What is Property, which was released in 1840 at this point, because he says, if every violation of property without distinction, without a more exact def definition, is termed theft, will not all private property be theft? He starts to talk about how the rights of the landowners are really just a kind of uh, irrational but imposed by the state, whereas the rights of the poor are rational, natural, but are neglected by the state. But he's still a liberal at this point. And this time he's trying to mold and transform um, society through journalism, through public opinion, a very common liberal idea at the time. But again, this Prussian censor pops up 
and um, puts pressure on the paper, tries to censor the paper over this Wood article. This, this was the controversial article. Marx refuses to back down or tone down his material. The shareholders start to panic, and Mark, Marx actually re resigns from the Rheinische Zeitung rather than accept any censorship. One thing I should mention before we move on is that Marx, there's an interesting article in which Marx, as the editor of the paper, explicitly rejects communism. It, somebody accuses the paper of communism because they published a, another article by a communist writer. And Marx in this, he says, um, that the Rheinische Zeitung does not admit that communist ideas in their present form possess even theoretical reality and therefore can't even consider it possible. But he adds, we will subject these ideas to a thoroughgoing criticism. And it was that thoroughgoing criticism that led to Marx eventually becoming a communist, effectively, in, in his intellectual development. Um, and so being, being blocked by the Prussian censor, again, another we see this um, intellectual conscientiousness, wanting to dive into and grasp reality. We see this indignation at the, the suffering of the oppressed and the, the robbery of the property owners, but we also see this iron determination, which never leaves him, that every time he encounters a block and a, and a limitation, Rather than just accepting it or backing down, if anything, he becomes more determined and more belligerent to overcome that limitation. As a result, he leaves Prussia. He, he spends a short period of time in Switzerland and then ends up in France in October 1843. And it's at this point that we can speak of Marx uh, becoming a communist of sorts and embracing communism. But when I say Marx becomes a communist, I don't mean he becomes a Marxist. What I mean is that he encounters the various schools of French communism and socialism that were exploding onto the scene in the 1840s. There was a really vibrant scene, if you like. It reminds me a little bit, there's one parallel in the, the current popularity of the word communism, at least, and communist ideas now. Millions of youth all over the world are embracing communism in one form or another. Well, in the 1840s, you had uh, uh, papers, journals, pamphlets circulating amongst hundreds of thousands of people in France, especially in the working class, concentrated, not only, but concentrated in Paris. The most popular communist probably in the world at that time was a guy by the name of Etienne Cabé. Etienne Cabé was a, a classical utopian communist. Explicitly, he said he wanted to found a utopia. He was inspired by reading Thomas More's Utopia when he spent time in England. He also read Robert Owen. I'm not going to be able to go into detail about Robin, Robert Owen. I'm going to confine myself to the French a bit. But he actually... he. His, his communism was called Icarian communism because he wrote a novel, it was a fictional account, about a traveller who discovers an undiscovered island called Icaria, where everyone lives under communism. Very much like Moore's Utopia, if you've if you ever read it. But he started publishing an almanac, but a journal, exp expounding these communist ideas, which had a circulation of about 500,000 in, in 1843. So this is popular stuff, but still of quite a mystical utopian nature. But on the front page of this, um, of this almanac, I thought you'd be quite interested to learn that the, the main slogan that he put forward was from each according to his ability to each according to his need. You might recognize that from Marx's critique of the Gotha program where he explains that the, the absolute the end principle of the higher phase of communism is precisely that. Cabet coined that phrase. He didn't come up with the idea though because French communism has an even longer pedigree than that. Uh, a guy by the name of Morally um, in the mid 18th century actually took enlightenment ideas about the state of nature, natural law and so on and came to the conclusion that the natural state of human beings is communistic and therefore private property is against human nature, is wrong, and the correct natural moral way to live is a communistic way, in which he started to put forward the idea that everyone would contribute what they can, everyone would be maintained by the, the public good, and there would be no private property whatsoever except for the fulfillment of personal needs, you know, your food, your toothbrush, that kind of thing. Many of these ideas will be familiar to. These are the basic ideas of communism. However, this communism, it had an idealistic character. It's human nature is communistic, therefore we must have communism. There's no real social development. There's no question of the productive forces at this point. Um, it also has, yeah, it has a utopian moral element and it also has a Spartan element. And we see this, uh, this these ideas develop after the French Revolution um, as a trend, after the kind of the, the, the defeat and the disappointment of the highest phase of the revolution with Jacobins, you have what's called the conspiracy of the equals in 1796 led by a man who named himself Gracchus, after Tiberius Gracchus in ancient Roman history, uh, Gracchus Babuf. This conspiracy of the equals called for the abolition of private property, the abolition of inheritance and any basically individual pr privilege whatsoever, and an absolute leveling, an absolute equality. They said that the democratic rights of 1789 were not enough. What we need was absolute equality. Again, so the idea of extreme republicanism, revolution, insurrection, communism, there are trends here that you can detect in Marxism later on, but there's, there's something that Marx, Marx rejected all these communists. That's why he said they had no re theoretical reality, because there was no development here. And actually, the, the, the Babuvists 
rejected things like art. If they said, we, if we have to get rid of art and culture and so on in order to have equality, then so be it. And Marx rejected that. He called it barracks communism. It, in other words, it, 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 to, it tended to have more in common, common with uh, primitive communism than it did with the modern communism that Marx eventually embraced. Marx was arguably, so he took, he took ideas from these communists, but he was arguably more influenced by the, the socialists, actually. Even though at this time, he never called himself a socialist. He always referred to himself as a communist. But he was heavily influenced by socialists, especially Saint-Simon and, and also Charles Fourier. Now, Saint-Simon and Fourier were both dead by the time Marx arrives in Paris. They, they both died in the 1820s. Interestingly, they were not popular at all. Saint-Simon was so disappointed that his ideas weren't spreading, he shot himself. He survived the suicide attempt, but I think what you can get from that is he didn't lead this mass movement at all. He did have a handful of disciples, effectively, um, but he didn't have a mass movement. Fourier stopped writing in the 1820s because he thought nobody wanted to hear it. And yet these two men became probably the most influential men in French socialism in the 1840s and had a direct impact on Marx's ideas. I don't really have time to go into detail, which is a great shame because I actually have tons of notes on Saint-Simon in particular. But one thing that, I, there was actually something more scientific about their still rather utopian socialism than the communists. The communists were basically like, we need to live under absolute equality, let's just have it. Either by insurrection or by setting up communes. Uh, you know, Cabe wanted everyone to move to America, set up frontier colonies where everyone lives in absolute equality, they, and they did. They all failed, although one actually managed to establish the oldest winery in Illinois. So there you go. The heritage of, of communism in America, in the United States. Um, so it has this utopian uh, character. Saint-Simon, I know we refer to Saint-Simon as utopian, but basically Saint-Simon took all of the science, including the, the, the science of political economy from Adam Smith. He was greatly inspired by the French Revolution, the American Revolution, and the works of Adam Smith and Isaac Newton in England, in England or sorry, Britain, including Scotland. Um, he re referred to Adam Smith as the immortal Adam Smith. He wanted to establish a European-wide government. He wanted to unify the European continent, and he wanted to establish a European-wide government, which he would call the Council of Newton, established by universal suffrage. He basically believed in bourgeois science, and what he said is that on the basis of the development of bourgeois science, you would eventually come to a point where there'd be no need for any state because the state, as he explained, is required for holding down the oppressed. You needed that under feudalism because society and civilization, as he put it, was not yet mature enough he compared it to childhood, that the child needs like a parent or a teacher to instruct him. The feudal state for him was like that. But now in what he called industrial society, he never used the word socialism, industrial society, you would have a, a situation of statelessness and basically a technocracy of enlightened industrialists, artists, scientists, and bankers, interestingly, who would basically plan the economy. So we're talking about a planned economy, but he doesn't talk about the abolition of private property. He doesn't talk about socialism. In other words, this, and he was writing this in about 1802. I mean, then he wrote later. So he's writing this in a t at a time when industrialization in France hadn't yet begun. So he's viewing industrialization from the outside and basically rationalizing capitalism as it's coming into being in a kind of a utopian form. So really, this ideal society that Saint-Simon is talking about is industrial capitalism, but he thinks it's gonna solve all the contradictions of capitalism. His followers later on, after his death, I mean, they split. Some went off in a, because he, he started developing very mystical ideas about the new Christianity. He also started to embrace the cause of the proletariat. He said that the purpose of all this, all of his ideas, is to uh, improve as quickly as possible the condition of the proletariat. However, he, he explicitly rejected revolution. It was never about workers' power. He said, I'm addressing this to you, the industrialists, the capitalists, the bankers, because you need to govern society in order to help the proletariat. So this is entirely uh, reformist. And many French liberals were directly influenced by Saint-Simon. His ideas contain the embryo of small state liberalism. He said, but not, not of the Thatcherite variety, because he, says, he said, you can have a small state by cutting the state bureaucracy, cutting the army to nothing, and using the money to help the poor. The reason that his ideas are now known as socialism is superficially because one section, one section of his followers went off on a, a search for the female messiah, which he predicted, like a Dune-style crusade, <laughs> which didn't go anywhere. Another set of his followers took over a liberal paper called The Globe and transformed it into a Saint-Simonian socialist paper. And the first person, at least, that I'm aware of to use the word socialist is, um, in French at least, is Paul Leroux, who was the editor of The Globe. They rejected co co uh, competition, capitalist competition, and they said, basically, we need to have a scientifically planned economy for the benefit of the proletariat, but without revolution, without workers' power. But So the, the scientific element here is the recognition that industry lays the basis for the abolition of the state and oppression and, and equality and so on, not just 
let's just erase everything or level everything. And Marx was more keen on that idea than the utopian uh, or republican communists. The utopian element is that this, this is achieved under capitalism by the capitalists thinking it's a good idea to basically eliminate the source of their profit. That was completely utopian. And the reason it became socialist is because these ideas of industrial society were completely in contradiction with the real interests of the real capitalist class. Um, but this had a, a major impact on, on French socialists. Um, another, I, I'm running out of time already, but another inf very influential French socialist is Charles Fourier. Now, Charles Fourier was a, a, a very talented writer, and he basically dealt with all of the bitter contradictions and hypocrisies of capitalist society. One thing that he was particularly strong on was the question of the family. He condemned marriage as an institution. He put forward an idea of a society in which women were completely free of men. You had no marriage. You had, sim again, similar to the ideas, at least the conclusions put forward by Engels, without the same level of scientific research that went into it. Again, it was a bit of a a moral idea that he saw the oppression of women. He was, he's thought to be the first person to coin the term feminist, at least in French. He called himself a feminist, and he said that the basis of progress is the, the, the conditions of the female sex. Um, and that had a bit more majorly influential uh, impact on Marx and Engels' ideas. You'll notice that in the Communist Manifesto, they talk about the abolition of the family long before Mar Engels' origin of the family. It came from Fourier. They didn't just suck it out of their thumb. Again, it was more scientific than the communists because they talked about stages in society. Again, similar to Saint-Simon, feudalism was a necessary stage. Capitalism, what Fourier called civilization, is a necessary stage. But inevitably, there must be a stage beyond that. That stage was um, socialism. And, but the way that Fourier said that we were going to get there was by people setting up what he called phalansteres and living in phalanxes of about 1,600 people, in other communes, basically. It wasn't an agricultural commune, it was a big building, like an apartment block, where everyone would, He's, he had very interesting, I don't have time to go into it, but he was, he was an early anthropologist, really. He studied children, and he studied how their, their play emulates labor. You can imagine what education was like in France in the 1820s. He was well ahead of his time. And he, he also um, talked about how actually human beings, he said, this idea of people being idle and lazy, an argument that you must have encountered when you're talking about socialism. He dismisses it based on his study of society. He says all human beings are constantly working. Labor is actually a source of pleasure and development. And so the purpose of society and socialism is to give people the variety of labor to develop themselves. Again, you'll be familiar with all these ideas because these, really this is what Marx and Engels are talking about when they talk about socialism. However, his means of getting there was completely utopian. And again, like the Cabe Icarians, lots of Fourierites went over to the United States, often founded colonies on Indian land, fought off the Indians to, to establish their socialist colony. And then of course they were just absorbed into American capitalism. But all of these ideas had a major impact, but there's something missing, there's something you might have already picked up on. That the role of the working class is either completely ignored and absent, or the working class, the proletariat, is treated as an impoverished mass to be elevated by the enlightened. Now that reflects the times. The, the organized working class and the political working class movement was only just beginning to come into being at this time in France. But, um, but there was no, this, this was not a proletarian revolutionary trend at all. Even the communists that talk about insurrection, it was a bit ambiguous as to who was to carry out the insurrection really. It could be a handful of just committed uh, you know, revolutionaries. It wasn't the emancipation of the working class by itself. And this was, I would say, Marxist contribution. Um, and it's, it's interesting that this, I mentioned this explosion of socialist ideas in France at the time. The reason for that, bear in mind that in the 20s, the socialists were getting nowhere, it was the rise of the working class. It's thanks to the working class. This also, I don't have time to go into it, but it shows the relationship between middle class intellectuals who develop, develop theories and the class movement. There's a dialectical re relationship between these forces. Not because, it's not that people like Fourier are required to give workers ideas. The workers developed conscious in the course of struggle and then took slogans, ideas from these intellectuals to give form to their demands. A, a perfect um, factual true example is the main demands of the workers' movement in the revolution of 1848 were the organization of labor and the right to work. Both of these expressions are from Fourier and then were popularized by the, the writer Louis Blanc. But Louis Blanc didn't really add very much uh, to these. Um, also, workers in Lyon, who launched an insurrection, and basically took over the city. It's almost like a precursor to the Paris Commune, more short-lived. In 1834 and 1831, they wrote, wrote on their banner for the first time addressing the workers. That was the first time the French working class had lifted a, a flag calling for the workers to struggle for their own interests. The person who coined the term working class in France was Saint-Simon. But for, for Saint-Simon, the working class included the capitalists, bankers, 
and so on, as well as the actual workers, because he was opposing the working class or the industrial class to the idlers of the church and the, the noble, um, you know, the, the feudal nobility. So you're seeing that the working class is basically taking these more abstract utopian ideas and actually expressing it in its own class interest. And Marx, it's interesting that Marx, the outsider from the more backward country where the workers' movement didn't really exist at this time, he sees what the French socialists didn't see. Another thing that helped Marx is philosophy, actually. Marx at this time also had encountered the ideas of Ludwig Feuerbach, who had an immense impact on Marx. Marx, when he published the, the, um, the Deutsch-Französische Jahrbuch in, uh, I think, February 1844, when he, after he arrived in France, he wrote to Ludwig Feuerbach, first of all saying, first let me express my love for you. And then he said, Your philosophy, you have provided the philosophical basis for communism. Why? What, what was this philosophical basis? What Feuerbach said is that religion does not determine the course of history. Religion does not create man. Man creates religion. What all religion is, is the alienated expression of man. Because we are unable to express our essence, this is the abstract way that Feuerbach put it, we're not able to be ourselves effectively because of the constraints of the world and of society. We therefore create an abstract, perfect being. That's what Christ is, basically. Christ is us anthropomorphizing our own alienated essence. That had a huge impact, not just on Marx, but a whole generation, basically, of, of German intellectuals and philosophers. But Marx went a little bit further. He still thought, he considered himself a Feuerbachian at this point, but he'd actually, he'd already begun to go a bit further than Feuerbach, because he said that we have to begin with man. Man creates religion, therefore we have to interest ourselves with man and study man. Feuerbach said that. But he said, man is a totality of social relations. Feuerbach didn't say that. Feuerbach talked about man in the abstract. It was still unclear whether he meant individual society. Marx already took another step in the direction of materialism. Feuerbach was a materialist and he rejected the existence of a deity. He studied the laws of the natural world. But when it came to history, his, his kind of alternative was just that we need to find a, a humanist religion that basically celebrates and worships real human beings, and then we'll be all right. Um, he kind of rejected historical materialism, or rather the pot potential for that, because it didn't exist. Marx, on the other hand, already, he, he raises the problem without solving. He says we need to study social relations. He hasn't yet embarked on a study of those social relations. So he's basically a Feuerbachian communist, if you like, at this time. Apparently, Feuerbach was very pleased. Engels wrote to Robert Owens, an article for Robert, Robert Owens' part, um, paper, declaring that the most eminent genius of our time, Ludwig Feuerbach, has embraced communism, and this is the most important development. So this is, this is the state of their ideas at this time, moving forwards, but under the guise of another person's philosophy. Um, and let's see where we are. It's at this point that um, Marx encounters a young man by the name of Frederick Engels. There's a whole other lead off on the life of development of Frederick Engels. I'm not gonna have time to go into detail, but what I can tell you is Frederick Engels had been working in his father's factory in Salford, by Manchester in, in England. There he had encountered English political economy, he was fluent in English, but also he'd encountered the working class and the class struggle as it was developing in England at this time. He arrived in England in 1842. That's the same time as the plug plot, a revolutionary general strike that gripped all of the mill districts in Lancashire, and I think also West Yorkshire. A revolutionary general strike of the working class, raising political demands, that's the charter as in votes for workers and other democratic demands, but also social demands. The point of this was for the workers really to transform society. Engels saw that and heard accounts of it from chartists firsthand. Uh, and so he was greatly influenced. This is when, it was on the basis of this that he wrote his work, The Conditions of the Working Class in England. Marx had already come to the conclusion from Feuerbach and from his, Marx actually encountered workers in Paris and discussed with workers, as well as encountering these French socialist ideas. So before he, um, he had briefly met Engels in 1842, but before his kind of history making meeting with Engels in August 1844, Marx had already drawn the conclusion that the working class was going to liberate and emancipate the whole of mankind. The basis, you know, remember he said there was no theoretical reality for communism. Marx found the theoretical reality of communism in the working class and in the proletariat. The reason why, he, he explained philosophically, was that the reason the proletariat is the base of communism is because they have, the private property has already been abolished for the, work, for, the, for the working class, for the proletariat. He said what is required is a class that is already outside of civil society that has no property and therefore its liberation will be the abolition of all classes. So this is a combination of his, his limited experience of the working class movement that was beginning to rise in France at this time, his philosophical understanding of Feuerbach and his interpretation of the other French socialists. He meets Engels in August 1844. They realize after several days of late night discussions, they are absolutely unanimous on the fundamental points. And Engels has quite an important influence on Marx because Engels comes to Marx with all these stories about the Chartist movement and the real working class as it was developing in England. 
They then decided to settle accounts with their former friends, the young Hegelians. So that's what the Holy Family, or the great title, the Critique of Critical Criticism, is all about. I can't go into detail about this, but the main point I want to draw out is this idea that they attacked idealism effectively. They say that ideas on their own can do nothing. They also attacked the passivity and the, the contempt that the young Hegelians had for the masses. The masses were just kind of a, a stupid mob to be directed by the idea. Marx explains that, um, that, the, that uh, he says, ideas cannot carry out anything at all. And he emphasizes it's the struggle of the masses and in particular the workers that are the engine of pro progress. Not the ideas, but revolution and the struggle of the masses. And he actually says, the reason we can be sure that he actually discussed with workers is because in the Holy Family he says, people must know the studiousness, the craving for knowledge, the moral energy and the unceasing urge for development of the French and English working, uh, workers to be able to form an idea of the human nobility of this movement. The next step for Marx, in Marx and Engels' journey is that first Marx is kicked out of Paris, again under pressure from the Pr Prussian government, um, the French government of Guizot, who gets an honorable mention in the Communist Manifesto. Um, it expels him from the country and Marx ends up, ends, ends up in Brussels. But he and Engels actually take a trip to England. Engels introduces himself to Chartists uh, and also acquires works of English political economy that he had already started reading and writing about. The Deutsch Französische, Französische Jahrbücher, apologies, uh, had actually published an article by Frederick Engels on um, political economy. So this is what, having already identified the problem of, well, if we're going to understand man, we need to understand social relations, Marx dives into it. This is where his economic and philosophical manuscripts comes from. He starts to understand social relations by understanding political economy. He writes later in 1859 that it's at, around this time that he understood that the anatomy of civil society is to be found in, the political, in political economy. And the conclusions he comes to is, to give a very short version of events, historical materialism. This is where historical materialism is born. And this is where we start to see the emergence of what we would call a mature Marxist communism, a scientific theory of communism. First, he settles accounts with Feuerbach. They had been enamored with Feuerbach. They had been Feuerbachians. But um, to clarify his own thoughts, Marx writes his theses on Feuerbach. I don't have time to go into this. The most famous a uh, quote from that is, philosophers have only interpreted the world hitherto. The point is to change it. What he's, the point he's making there is that actually understanding of reality can only be made through trying to change it. R the recognition of alienation can only be solved by a radical revolution to transform conditions. Um, but one thing that I want to emphasize from the uh, theses on Feuerbach is that he says here, Feuerbach resolves the essence of religion into the essence of man. So that's a step forward. But the essence of man is no abstraction inherent in each single individual. In its reality is the ensemble of social relations. Um, and this sets the stage for the German ideology, a work that was never published, never finished, but basically is the first work of developed historical materialism. In it, um, they settle accounts not only with Feuerbach, but with other well-known, now completely unknown, German socialists of the time, like Karl Grun, um, in which they put forward a, a scientific view, not only of society, but of communism. I'm just going to give you a couple of examples for, for lack of time. One quote from the German ideology is, the social structure and the state are continually evolving out of the life process of definite individuals, of, but of individuals not as they may appear in their own or other people's imagination, but as they really are, i.e. as they operate and produce materially, and hence as they work under definite material limits, presuppositions and conditions independent of their will. That is really the same idea that is expressed later on as relations of production, independence of their will. We're talking about the lawful development. That in the German ideology, they also talk about the development and manufacturing of in industry, the history of the economy, forming different stages in society, um, determining the evolution of private property. So it's not just that Marx is announcing, that, oh, we have to have a materialist understanding. Another thing I want to emphasize is Marx's materialism was always one of empirical research and concreteness combined with praxis, with this emphasis on revolutionary praxis. The reason Marx hadn't identified himself as a materialist up to that point is because he said materialism was passive and contemplative. That basically it saw the world as, yes, material objects, but kind of material objects without their own internal life. And he said that the life and the movement was given by idealism, by things like idealist dialectics. In bringing those th things together, we get what we call dialectical materialism, but we also get the most revolutionary philosophy ever created, and also a scientific theory of communism. What is this scientific theory of communism? He explains, communism is for us, they explain, Marx and Engels together, is not a state of affairs which is to be established 
an ideal to which reality will have to adjust itself. We call communism the real movement which abolishes the present state of things. The conditions of this movement result from the premises now in existence. What are the premises? The premises are industry and the development of production that Saint-Simon had already hinted at, and the development of a propertyless proletariat, the modern working class. They explain that it has to have rendered the great mass of humanity propertyless for com uh, communism to succeed, and the development of um, the productive forces have to have unified the world economy and produced actually the productive basis for abundance. He said, otherwise, one, communism will just be a local event like the colonies I talked about, and it will just be reabsorbed into the world market, which is precisely what happened, or all the old shit will return. Excuse my language, that is the word that he uses, so I feel excused by, by just repeating what he said. Which, again, we can see in his, I don't have time to go into why I'm saying this, but in history we can see that without a high level of the development forces taking up the best that capitalism has to offer and developing in order to produce abundance, that all of the institutions of state, oppression, and ultimately classes will return. Basically, everything we identify with the Marxist theory of communism is contained, perhaps to, in a slightly embryonic form, in the German ideology. But as I already mentioned, this was not published. Um, and one thing I want to touch on is, I've talked quite a lot about practice, but what, what did Engel, Marx and Engels do in practice? Having clarified, and it's interesting, first they clarified their understanding. They established a theoretical scientific basis for what they wanted to do, rather than just doing things for the sake of it. They then decided, well, we have to actually carry this into practice. What did that mean? What it meant, first of all, was the establishment of what they called the Communist Corresponding, Correspondence Committee. The purpose of that was to reach out to already existing socialists and communists like uh, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, um, and the English chartists, in other words, people that didn't share their ideas but generally shared their goals, in order to first establish relations, share information. They were always in, uh, internationalists. I think they were helped in this fact by the, the fact that Marx was being chased from country to country. Uh, internationalists by necessity, if you like. Um, accident expressing necessity, you might say. Um, to establish connections with this movement, to inform themselves, get rid of this narrowness and chauvinism, which poisoned all of us. Like the German socialists thought that their philosophy was best, so they didn't bother with any of other, uh, other aspects. They were ignorant of other things. Uh, the French thought that the politi their politics and their socialism meant that they didn't need to study f German philosophy. They were trying to overcome all this, but also Marx, in a letter to Proudhon on the 6th of May, 1846, he says, in the moment of action, it makes sense. It will help for us all to be able to act in unison. What this idea contains is the idea of international revolution. If we succeed in taking power in, say, France, we need to be able to export the revolution and learn the lessons. Already, they're beginning to develop the embryo. This embryo was, I guess, killed before it could come to fruition, but at the embryo of the first international, which applied the same principle. But they also, Engels actually went to workers' communities. These are German workers. German artisans would do what's called the Wanderjahre, where they would travel to different places, ply their trade. Engels, and they had educational societies. This was a period of developing class consciousness and class struggle in the 1840s. They called it the Hungry 40s. And you had educational societies of hundreds of members coming to meetings of hundreds of people to debate economics, philosophy, science, and socialism. Engels was going along to these German-speaking meetings and debating with followers of Proudhon, Karl Grun, who was basically putting forward the same projects as Proudhon. I'm going to come up to Proudhon in a moment. Um, to win them over to the revolutionary communism that he and um, Eng Marx was uh, putting forward. And there are some interesting, to my opinion, fascinating and quite amusing letters from Engels where he writes reports. Now, anyone who's written, who's done an intervention in a meeting to try to win people over and then has written a report to, uh, you know, whatever, their branch or the, the National Centre will sympathise with Engels' his writing here. He describes that he says, oh, these people were talking absolute rubbish. I gave them the lashing with my tongue and then we had a vote at the end and I won 13 to 3. And if we can organise openly, I'll organise 100 of these chaps. It's, uh, the optimism uh, it really leaps off the page. But what we can see is Marx and Engels weren't just writing books. They were actually getting involved in the movement. But they were always emphasising not just doing things for the sake of it, but first we have to have clarity and we have to organise a movement on the correct basis and convince people on the strength of their ideas. Actually, their ideas are all they had. And this was recognised explicitly. Engels wrote to Marx and said, the theoretical side, he said, we must demonstrate our theoretical superiority over all of the trends, especially the most popular. And he said to Marx, you need to write more, because he saw Marx as the, you know, the, the pioneering genius in all this. And he, he said, all we have is the theoretical side, but that is the most important. And it proved to be the most important. And so in, in doing this, the first published work of historical materialism is The Poverty of Philosophy, Marx's critique of Proudhon's thought. Now, I don't really have time to go into a, a, 
everything that Marx had to say about Proudhonism. But Proudhon was heavily influenced by Saint-Simon. He was also part of this trend that drew the conclusion from the French Revolution that you should not have revolutions, that it gets us nowhere. And therefore, what he put forward was that if you render the basis of the state obsolete, it will just disappear of its own accord. If you mess about trying to struggle and take the state, you become part of the problem. Um, his theory of the state, and he said what we need instead is anarchy. He, he, he is the first anarchist. The way they were going to, and he said that the scientific basis for all this was in political economy. Like Marx, he was influenced by dialectics. I think it was Marx that actually first introduced him to dialectics. Um, I can't remember what Marx said. It was much to his detriment I introduced him to dialectics, he said. And he, he studied English political economy. He was considered in France an expert on political economy. Marx said that he has the misfortune of being misunderstood. In Germany, he's considered a bad philosopher and a good economist. In France, he's considered a good philosopher and a bad economist. Uh, we have to disabuse them of this illusion. Uh, and he basically said that use value and exchange value will always exist. Exchange value, that is the proportions in which commodities are exchanged, is based on scarcity, and therefore, because you will never have in infinite products, you always have some kind of scarcity, use value is, is the usefulness that the people want it. Therefore, because you're always gonna have this contradiction between use value and exchange value, the task of society, uh, and the, the value of a commodity is determined by free will. What he means by this is the seller wants to sell it for a, a certain amount, the buyer wants to sell it for a certain amount, they come to an agreement. This is a very common idea in contract law. In French contract law, they still teach this idea. It's the idea of the wills, the volonté. And he said, this is inevitable, and he extrapolates from this the sense that, therefore, socialist relations are determined by free will, and that society can freely choose to organize things a different way. But there's an interesting idea here that, on the one hand, these laws are inevitable. You cannot escape the laws of commodity production and exchange, but you can willfully build a, he didn't call it socialist, but an anarchist society on this basis. If that's confusing, that's because it's confused. That basically, his mistake is to render eternal the laws of bourgeois production. He says, you have to have commodities in exchange because of the division of labor. But then he describes a bourgeois division of labor in which individuals have to produce commodities to survive. That did not exist 10,000 years ago. There was a social division of labor, but the division of labor of manufacturing or commodity producers did not exist. So he's historically wrong, basically. And what's interesting about Marx's rebuttal of this is he doesn't just say, you're a reformist, you're wrong. He doesn't even just say, you've just rendered eternal the laws of bourgeois production, which he does say. He then goes to prove it by giving a whole history of bourgeois production. Uh, much of what we see in the Communist Manifesto, in that incredible history-changing first part of the Communist Manifesto, is a more concise, poetic version of what he explains to Proudhon. In other words, again, the Marxist method is you identify the incorrectness of an idea, the falsity of an idea, you don't just say, that's wrong. You then explain why it's wrong, where that idea has come from, and then give the whole course of historical development in order to establish the, the veracity of your point. And in terms of Proudhon's conclusions, he drew the conclusion that the way that we can willfully create a society in which there's no need for a state, and we don't have to struggle against the state, which is Saint-Simon's idea, is unlike Saint-Simon, which was the, the industrious, the bankers, and the artists improve the conditions of the poor, Proudhon based himself more on the working class to his credit. That's because he'd encountered the, the workers of Lyon and enc encountered their mutual societies, which were similar to co-ops. So he said that workers should save up, they should establish their own factories on a cooperative basis, they should exchange their products only on the basis of the cost of production, the cost of the materials, and then a small uplift for labor cost. Because he said that that, he basically said that pro pro uh, profit is what comes on top of that. He didn't have the same theory of value of Marx which sadly I don't have time to go into. But basically, if workers produce in cooperatives and then exchange their products at only the cost of production, then you will eliminate all prop uh, property. Engels pointed out that that's already been tried in England and failed catastrophically because you're producing on a capitalist basis, but then deliberately not making any profit, so thus going out of business. And he was putting this forward as a panacea. that If only the workers all did this, then what they'd do is they'd be so successful, they'd buy out all the capitalists, the capitalists and the state would just kind of watch this go by, I suppose. they buy up all the capitalists and then everything would be planned on a cooperative basis. There'd be no state and that was kind of the you know, anarchist future for mankind. And as you can probably imagine, that was attractive to people. You're a worker, especially, you, you can't imagine the trauma of having gone through the revolutionary period as well and people have lived through that. And if someone's saying, we don't have to have a repetition of all of that, just set up a cooperative, do your work, eat, treat people fairly and we'll be all right. That, you can understand why that was attractive. And so that was the main, that is why Marx and Engels felt they had to publish a devastating critique of this because they were arguing with people, in Paris in particular, against this, these ideas. The result, of course, was the, um, the poverty of philosophy. Now, what did Marx say 
in contrast to this reformism. Uh, by the way, Proudhon was skeptical of trade unions because he said, if you raise wages, then you'll just raise prices, which was a very common idea in bourgeois political economy at this, this time. Incidentally, you might have been confused. I always found this interesting that in the Communist Manifesto, Marx, even though he says that Proudhon is a petty bourgeois thinker, he doesn't include him in the section on petty bourgeois socialism. You might remember. He includes him in the section on bourgeois socialism, even though Proudhon was not a bourgeois. The reason he said he was a bourgeois socialist is because Proudhon wanted a capitalism without a proletariat. He wanted everyone to produce commodities on a capitalist basis, but somehow have none of the inequality and oppression of capitalism. So what was, what was Marx's alternative to this? His alternative was simply nothing other than the real development of the real working class in England in particular. Again, he'd just given the history of capitalism. He then gave the history of the working class movement in chart chartism, which he'd seen to an extent firsthand. Um, he talks about how the growth of trade unionism led to the creation of a national political party, the National Charter Organization, which fought for democratic rights and social transformation at the same time. He said that will lead directly to a civil war. The reason he put that is because you'd had revolutionary general strikes, you had the Newport insurrection, you had the potential for a full-scale war between the classes in England in the 30s and 40s at times. So these that based, based on the real development that he had looked at, he drew the conclusion that this is the future for the class struggle everywhere that develops capitalism. That's what's coming in France. By the way, that is exactly what happened in France in 1848, but that's another story. Um, and therefore, he counterposed this idea of workers just avoiding the class struggle by setting up businesses on their own account, the real class struggle and revolution. And he said, we shouldn't reject the political revolution. Every political revolution is a social revolution. And he says that he concludes the task of social science until the day when we have abolished capitalism and class society, the task of social science will always be combat or death. Um, taking a quote from the French novelist Georges Sand. Um, so he, they've announced their program and they've started trying to spread it. But this, I want to come back to this idea of theoretical superiority. It sounds rather smug and arrogant, doesn't it? But we, we see in practice what that actually meant. Because Marx and Engels were theoreticians without an organization. The Correspondence Committee was just that. It was sending letters and trying to establish links. But through their works and their theoretical superiority, they ended up taking over a whole revolutionary organization, the League of the Just. The League of the Just was uh, basically a Blanquist organization. Blanqui himself was a Republican communist like Gracchus Babeuf, uh, but a more modern variety, he based himself more on the proletariat. His organization, the Society of the Seasons, which was a secret, organ it had to be secret in those days to be fair, but it was a secret uh, organization that tried to launch an insurrection in 1839. About 500 armed men took over the Hotel de Ville, the town hall in Paris, and tried to, and what they thought was that the masses, just like revolutions in the past, the masses would see that and think, great, let's go and, and take over the city. They didn't, they ignored them because that's not unfortunately how revolutions work. And so they were isolated and they were arrested and had to flee. The League of the Just was a German organization which participated in that. They were part of the armed men that fought alongside Blanqui because you had quite a lot of German workers in Paris at that time. When they went off into exile to places like England, they retained their communist beliefs tinged with a certain amount of apocalyptic Christianity. Wilhelm Weitling was probably their most outstanding leader. He was a work, he, he grew up in a very poor background. Single mother who was a servant. He educated himself and he became a revolutionary leader. He, ex, he put forward the idea of a violent insurrection, a war basically carried out by the proletariat in order to establish communism. It's very, very similar really to Blanquism, but he had a messianic Christian quality as well, which isn't surprising considering the tradition in Germany compared to the Republican tradition in France, but I won't go into further depth. What happens is a, a pivotal turning point in this is in 1846, if I remember right, where Weitling wants to persuade Marx and Engels and the Correspondence Committee to support a, an invasion of Prussia from outside. Basically, these German journeymen, these workers, were to arm themselves, cross over into the border and establish communism by a foreign invasion. Marx and Engels were not convinced. They have a meeting in London. This is the, a, a famous meeting where the, the, basically a, a decisive split occurred. Even though Marx and Engels weren't even members of the League of the Just, Marx actually wrote for the League of the Just paper forwards in Paris. They were close to them, but they never joined precisely because of this utopian Christian element. Anyway, in the course of this discussion, Engels is explaining why they don't agree with this. Marx interrupts him, stands up and just says, explain the theoretical basis for what you're doing and what, is, and what will be the result. He's sick and tired of hurrying up. Action, action, we need action, we need communism. Weitling, I don't know, I haven't been shown the actual answer he gave. He, apparently his answer was evasive. He didn't, he didn't give a clear answer and, and dismissive of oh, constant theorizing. And it's at that point that Marx slammed his fist on the table and said, ignorance never helped anyone. Again, this, this, this intellectual rigor. 
And this rejection of activism for activism's sake, to, to do things with a purpose and a clear theoretical basis is very apparent. That sent shockwaves through the League of the Just. Um, uh, there was a, a big split emerging where you had, a, had an anti-intellectual anti trend, not just Weitling, who was sick and tired of all this theorizing, and then another trend who thought that this was going all a bit too far. Um, Karl Schapper and Joseph Moll were two of the leaders of the League of the Just who were influenced by Marx's position. And eventually, Moll actually traveled to Brussels and spoke to Engels and Marx and said, we want you to come and take over the League of the Just. We have become completely convinced of your ideas, and we want you to attend a Congress in 1847 in which you can explain these ideas and they can become the program of the League. These Congresses took place in June and November, December 1847. The League of the Just was changed to the Communist League. Their slogan of all men are brothers was transformed to working men of all nations, countries unite, that you'll be familiar with. And they commissioned Marx to write a manifesto. The result, as you all know, is the Communist Manifesto. The greatest work of political literature ever written, arguably one of the greatest works of literature full stop ever written. I don't have time to go into the content, but to be fair, I think I already have. Because really, all of Marx's life up until this point and all of the ideas I've just discussed are there, clear in black and white, in the Communist Manifesto. His history of, of capitalism and the proletariat, he'd already developed in order to write Poverty of Philosophy. The second so se uh, section on arguments against communism and the demands of the communists come from the utopian socialists, but also the demands of the Chartists. This idea of winning the democratic revolution by force, a workers' government expropriating private property. They'd absorbed it all from the French socialists and from the English real workers' movement. The third section, criticizing all the different trends, I'm sure that's, that's obvious, it's all the different, particularly German, but other utopian trends that they've encountered on their way, and Proudhon, of course, to differentiate themselves theoretically from the rest. And in the fourth section about the real existing movements, it was their revolutionary strategy, their perspective for what the party is actually supposed to do in the coming period. And what they said the party was supposed to do was arm and rally revolutionaries, particularly German revolutionaries, for the inevitable coming revolution that was going to take place in Germany. That revolution was going to be a democratic revolution. You still didn't have national unification. You still had absolutism in the immediate tasks. But the task of the communists was in the course of this revolution, even if they're fighting side by side with the bourgeoisie, don't have time to go into what really happened, is to form the working class into a class capable of fighting for and winning power. Now, the 1848 revolution, and that, this really is where the story begins, to be honest. <laughs> this really is where the story of communism begins. I don't have time to go into it, but. Communism as we know it, Marxist communism, the scientific revolutionary communism of Marx and Engels is born at this point, clearly announced to the world. Now, the 1848 revolution proved to be an extremely harsh testing ground for all political tendencies, including the Communist League, which didn't survive it. The, the party that they were trying to arm and prepare for the revolution had literally a day between the publication of the Communist Manifesto in Germany and the outbreak of revolution in France in 1848. By the time it was translated in German, I'm skeptical as to the number of Communist League members who'd even read it by the time they went into Germany. The organization just dissolved like a sugar lump. But what we have is the lessons drawn from that document. Of course, it was on the base of those ideas that Marx would go on to found the, the First International to interpret the events of 1848, the Paris Commune. So it wasn't, it wasn't all a lost cause. But we have the benefit, unlike Marx, like Marx, we are standing on the threshold of a revolutionary wave far surpassing 1848 in both scope and depth, where unlike Marx, the pros uh, unlike in 1848, the prospect for the seizure of power and the total transformation of society on a world scale is directly before us. The material basis required for communism has been prepared. It's been prepared many times over, actually. And we stand at the, at, at the beginning of this immense revolutionary process. So it's incumbent on us to understand and grasp, to dive into these ideas in the way Marx did with his characteristic conscientiousness in order to arm ourselves and prepare for the harsh testing ground that is to come. And on that, I'll finish. Thank you.